My patient is chemically paralyzed on the ventilator. What do I need to know? You're taking care of a patient on the ventilator and they have been chemically paralyzed. Holy cow, what do you do? Another question from the Hey Sean series, question from the tribe. Someone was curious about caring for a patient who is on the ventilator who is chemically paralyzed. And for those that do not know what this is, um, when patients are in severe respiratory distress, they are in what we call ARDS, A-R-D-S. Pretty sure everybody can look that one up. When they are in ARDS and they are difficult to oxygenate, no matter what you do to the ventilator itself, their sats are in the toilet and you are on maximum support and their ABG shows refractory or worsening hypoxemia. And your provider will sometimes paralyze them, sometimes temporarily, sometimes for a certain amount of time. Temporary paralysis is just a one-shot deal, while other times we'll put them on a continuous chemical paralysis. For those of you that are familiar with anything in the ICU, those two medications, the first medication, Medication is used as a one-time deal. It's called Vecuronium, one of the many meds. And one of the common meds we use for when you want to put them on a continuous paralysis is called Nimbex or Cystacticurium. Big long word. In both cases, you as the nurse need to make sure that you are monitoring and caring for your patient in a safe, effective, proactive manner. It's not enough to know that they're paralyzed. How do you take care of them? What do you do? How in the world do you assess a paralyzed patient? How do you know if they're actually paralyzed? What level of para para paralysis are they? Wait a minute, can they feel anything? Are they awake? How in the world do you monitor that stuff? The two things that are common, the first is the what's called the train of four these are um, this is a monitoring tool that is used with peripheral nerve stimulation you can put them on the facial nerve which is one of the common areas and you can put them on the ulnar nerve which is one of the other common areas you're going to deliver your paralytic medication and then you're going to frequently check your train of four and what you're gonna do is this little itty bitty machine is gonna deliver four many volts to elicit a twitching response either in the ulnar nerve or the facial nerve. And if you have four out of four twitches, one, two, three, four, and the patient actually twitches four times, that tells you that they are not adequately sedated. On the other end of the scale, if you give the four twitches and you only see the twitch once, one out of four, that means they are heavily paralyzed. Normally, we titrate somewhere between the three to four, two to three range. Every facility is a little different. You're going to evaluate this like you would evaluate anything else in the ICU on a very frequent basis, at the very minimum hourly, sometimes more frequently, every 30 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, depends on how sick your patient is and how well they are paralyzed. The other monitoring tool that we have is called the BIS monitor, B-I-S, and it is the bispectral index, something along the, something like that. I don't use it a lot. I don't have a lot of experience. The BIS monitors are the monitors that are put along the forehead that are commonly used by anesthesia in the operating room, and it monitors alertness or awakeness. Now, if you have paralyzed your patient and they are completely awake, you are essentially 
torturing them. I think there was a movie called Awake or something along those lines where your patient was completely awake, but they were paralyzed. They couldn't move, but they were cognizant of everything that was going on. You can only imagine how torturous that really is. So the first rule of paralysis, the first rule of chemical paralysis is sedate them first. Sedation does not equal paralysis. Paralysis does not equal sedation. They are two different things. And you need to make sure that you adequately and effectively sedate your patient before you paralyze them. Sedate first, paralyze second. Sedation is a relative term. You're going to have to almost infer that they are going to be adequately sated with a given amount of medication. Hopefully, you will have the ability to sedate them appropriately first, then paralyze them. In severe extreme cases, that, that won't happen. You're going to have to give them a moderate to heavy dose of sedatives, then paralyze them. You're going to have to basically think of it as I need to overly medicate or overly sedate my patient so that they are adequately sedated and then paralyzed. As you grow into the profession, you'll know and you'll learn how much sedation is actually appropriate. And while you're learning these things, you're going to seek guidance from your providers as well as your senior nurses. This monitor, train of four, and you're going to pay special detail to skin breakdown. Skin breakdown is huge when it comes to paralyzing your patient. I mean, let's think about it. Think of that. Realistically, think about it. You have paralyzed your patient, so now they can't feel or they're not able to move when there is discomfort, when there is a, when there is a pressure ulcer developing in any part of the body, whether it on the coccyx, whether on the elbows, the shoulders, the shoulder blades, you know, the heels, they're not going to be able to move and adjust. They're not going to be able to do the squirm thing because something's uncomfortable because you have completely paralyzed them. So you have to be very diligent about skin care. If I had to think about anything else in regards to caring for the vented patient who is chemically paralyzed is paralysis doesn't mean that your gut stops working. Without going into the deep end of pathophysiology, the smooth muscles that are responsible for moving things through your gut are not the same muscles that are affected when you are chemically paralyzed. And we're just going to leave it at that. So you can, you can actually feed your patient with tube feeds while you have paralyzed them. Yes, it is okay. It is possible and it is common. We talked about the BIS monitor. We talked about the train of four, adequate sedation, and moving the gut. I can't, oh, and skin breakdown. Highlights, answering a question from the tribe. Want to know some things about caring for your patient when it comes to chemically paralyzing them. Caveat to the train of four is that the train of four can be skewed depending on patient's body habitus. And what I'm getting at is, is that if you have a morbidly obese patient who is utilizing the train of four and you put the train of four electrodes on their ulnar nerve and they are morbidly obese, the train of four is not going to deliver the effective electricity that it needs to in order to get to the actual nerve ending. So please be careful that you think that your patient is not adequate, you think that your patient is adequately sedated because you've had zero out of four twitches, but in reality there's just not enough contact in order to deliver the appropriate twitch. So morbidly obese patients, you usually want to go with the facial nerve because the facial nerve doesn't have as much adipose tissue face versus the ulnar nerve. And as always, check your own pulse first.